Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy. My channel is Finding Value. Today we're going to rip through Twitter, rip through X, <clears throat> see what people are talking about, give you my financial opinions. Uh, I may or may not think differently than either yourself or the people who are doing these posts. Uh, and uh, we'll rip through it. And if you want to follow me, it is at finding underscore finance. And you can join our community at finding-value.com. Use the word discount in the coupon code uh, if you'd like to get a discount. So ripping through, we've got Nick. The dividend snowball happens fast. First, the dividend covers your phone bill. Then the dividends cover your weekly grocery bill. Then the dividends cover your monthly mortgage bill. Then your dividends cover all your yearly living expenses. And then it covers your property taxes. And then it covers your second home. And then it covers your health insurance when you retire, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, That is what dividends do. Dividends come from the cash flow of companies. So when you look at a company, uh, a lot of the times when you evaluate a company, it will be a percent that they pay out in dividends. Uh, it can it can range from 40%, 10%, all the way up to 80, 90%. Uh, and sometimes the dividends even are greater than the cash flow that exists in uh, the company where they have to go into uh, cash that they've saved. Sometimes that's happened. So uh, dividends are or could be an important part of your portfolio and an important part of your strategy to get out of working a nine to five job. Uh, that is one aspect that I am using. And sometimes I put my savings into physical precious metals and I play the ratio game over in the physical metal side. None of this is short term. It's all long-term positioning and strategy. That is how you get ahead. It's not, I'm going to try to time the market with an option call that expires tomorrow. Like that is just, I mean, you probably have a higher percent gambling, putting it on red or black or something on a roulette table. Um, long-term strategy is about positioning. It's about thinking about what you're doing and having a strategy when you invest. Uh, I'm not saying that my strategy is the best. It is a strategy, and it's a strategy that I'm deploying. And generally, having a strategy is better than not having a strategy because if you've got a crappy strategy, at least you're aware of it and you know it's crappy and you can try something else and refine it. And then you can continue to refine the strategy to something that actually works and to something that uh, you are working towards. If it's retirement, is a strategy that will prepare you for that retirement. And this strategy could be investing in dividends. It could be uh, allocating money to certain accounts like 401ks, Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs, uh, and individual accounts and physical precious metals. So keep, all, keep that all in mind. And I do go over those things. I'm not, I can't tell you specifically what you can do as an individual, but I can tell you what I'm doing, how I'm setting some of my stuff up uh, and why I'm setting up that way. Uh, if your employer gave you a 5% raise and inflation was 5%, nothing changed. Ah, but actually it does change. So if you're saving the majority of your money, uh, let's say you're saving uh, 20%, 30%, 40% of your money. What that means is that your costs are lower than your income is. When that is the case, a 5% raise is still beneficial to the saver, even if inflation is 5%, because the costs that you are incurring in this system, a 5% against those costs is still less than 5% of your total income. So you actually benefit more with a 5% raise, even though inflation is 5%, uh, as long as your costs are less than, uh, than your income. You would also benefit if you have fixed costs, like say a 30-year mortgage on a home. 
Uh, that would also benefit because you're inflating away your fixed costs uh, of the home that you own of that fixed debt. It's not a variable debt. It's fixed 30-year debt. So the reason that I fixed my expenses and was and I prioritized that with a 30-year fixed rate loan at 2.75% is because of the very reason that this guy gives. A 5% raise does benefit me more even though inflation is at 5%, my costs, some of my costs are fixed and other costs are far lower than my income. So I definitely benefit even though uh, 5% and 5%, and, and, and this does change. It does allow me to save even more money. So that is something that uh, I don't think people realize. Uh, completion activity in America, oil basins, X Permian, has fallen off a cliff as the lag effect of rigs dropped three to six months ago plays out. Production stagnation decline in these basins and major slowdown in Permian growth equals double trouble impact on American oil supply going forward. So what he's got here is the other U.S. core oil started frack operations by week in 2022 and 2023. This is the rig count. Look at the rig count drop here, guys. Um, it's almost as low as 2020 in some areas. So we've got a weird situation where uh, they've cut back on rig count. Uh, oil production is probably going to pull back. And then we're going to see, at the same time, uh, pullbacks in uh, oil coming from OPEC. So they've cut production. This could all hit at the same time. This could be a really nasty upswing uh, in oil. Uh, which is great for oil investors, terrible for everyone else. Scrolling down to U.S. existing homes uh, sales slide to lowest rate since 2010. No one can afford to move with 7 to 8% mortgage rates. Um, and I think maybe, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't think people can afford to move. It's, I don't think people are, are able to buy that first house which is allowing people to sell the existing home, which allows them to move up if they want to move up from their first home to a second home. Uh, so things are all slowing down. Um, this is good to some extent because if it's low sales, not many people are going to have high interest rates and not a lot of foreclosures are going to come in the future if, if not many people are buying and selling at this time, especially if they can't afford it. They can't afford it. They're not affording it, <laughs> and you can see it in the sales numbers. Uh, Lance says, we don't have the inventory glut. We don't have the toxic loan products. We don't have lots of variable mortgages. What we do have, however, is deteriorating housing affordability, and it's getting worse. Uh, so that is something to think about. I think the affordability is slowing the home sales, and we don't have all the problems associated with uh, the market like we did in 2006, 7, 8, and, and so on. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki says, the point of owning a business is to buy real estate. Do you agree or disagree? I'm going to say this, guys. I think the point of a lot of things that we do in life is to buy more real estate or to buy better real estate. So if if, if I were to ask most individuals, and I would ask them, hey, look, if you won the lottery and you just got $500 million from the lottery, what are some things that you would do? They would say, oh, I would, I would definitely buy a new house. And it's like everyone has that as an answer. They would probably buy a house that's different than from the one that they're in. And that's one of the first things that comes to most people's minds. So when I hear some of these people, oh, um, if there's going to be this like large amount of inflation that home prices are going to go down, during a large inflationary period. I'm like, okay, if you were to add a zero to your account right now, if you were to 10X your wealth, everyone, what would you do? And you're like, oh, I'd probably buy a house because if the home prices didn't go up and you 10X your account, most likely more people are gonna buy homes. And I do not agree with those that think we can have large inflation and at the same time, have home prices go down dramatically. I, I, I just, I don't think that's congruent. I, I think the logic is flawed. If you dumped a bunch of money in my account, like a whole bunch, and you were to say, what are you going to do with it? 
I don't really have anything else to spend on. Like I don't, I could go on vacation, but I'm not going to be able to spend that amount of money. So really it's, I'll buy a house or update the house or fix the house. That's, that's really your only options. If you already have cars, so what, you know, I don't really care if you quote upgrade a car, you're not really upgrading anything. You're just buying a new car that's different than the car that you own that serves the same purpose. But I would say most people would buy a second house or they would buy a different house if they ran into a bunch of money. That'd be one of the first things that they would do. Or they would look at their life and say, what can I change to make my life better? Uh, here's U.UN. Something very special is happening. Uh, we were up again to get again today. We're putting in a big fat green candlestick. The green army's coming, guys. And it's ready to dominate. Uh, so get ready. Hold on to your shares. Maybe look at some of your smaller exploration plays if you want to add that haven't moved yet. Uh, it is a very speculative sector. I understand that. It's not a cash flow generation uh, rich sector. There's really only two companies that generate any cash flow. But it does look very good. Uh, so this guy says, currently at $94,000 invested, $6,000 away from the big $100,000 mark. It's so close, I can taste it. This is what I'll say, guys. It's just a number. You're going to hit it in the account. You're going to say, oh, that's awesome. And then it's going to be in the rearview mirror. That's what it's been like with every number that I've hit. It's kind of like, okay, that's great. Eh, okay, that, whatever. <laughs> and then it goes up and down and fluctuates uh, and goes all around the number. You keep piling money in. Um, as you get further into your investing um, time frame, uh, you, the, the money that you add into it becomes less and less impactful. Uh, to the overall account balance number. Uh, it, it's based more off of your investments and the compounding than it does on your uh, additions to the account. Even though you still like saving and putting more money in there, as the account grows, uh, it becomes more dependent on how good of an investor you are, how well you've structured the portfolio, how well you've chosen the companies, when you purchase those and the timeframes that you purchase them in. If it if you bought at the bottom of 2020 in a bunch of oil stocks, you're probably doing quite well, or energy service, or uranium, or whatever. Um, that's really what's going to drive your returns are those uh, compounding interest. What will the market do tomorrow? Doesn't matter. What will the market do in six months? Doesn't matter. What will it do in a year? Doesn't matter. Think in decades, not days. That's exactly the right time frame to think in when you think about the market. You don't want to think in days. You don't want to think in months. You don't want to think in necessarily single digit years. You want to think in longer time frames because it's, it's, you're playing a, a move where the fundamental market conditions are changing. A company only releases its earnings once every quarter. So, I mean, if you're changing, if, if you're exchanging shares less than a quarter, or so, you're not really even giving the company time to really change fundamentally. You're just being scared and moving on the market's whims and emotions. Uh, some of these companies, they take a little bit of time to bottom out and really start to move. They're at their inflection points of losing money to gaining, to making money, which means they're going to have negative earnings per share to positive. And that's generally when they go up ballistically. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for it to do it. Other times it's very quickly. It just depends on the market, depends on the commodity, depends on uh, your time frame. For that, you have to allow that to happen in the time frame. So your time frame has to match what the market will allow that company to change around and do, which is generally in a longer time frame than what most people adopt. It's not in year, you know a single digit year. It's in years. Uh, who else notices the bearish candle morphing into existence for U.S. equities priced in silver? Until this gets negated, a massive topping structure still playing out for the SPX when adjusted for silver price. So we could see silver outperform uh, the S&P 500 uh, and also the NASDAQ. <clears throat> but you're going to have to give it some time. It's coming around. Uh, and we're still early in this turning process. Uh, we've got uranium. 
Uh, Houston, we might have entered the fly zone. So this is CCJ versus Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, we are coming up into that fly zone. The fly zone is where we come out of the basing pattern <clears throat> in this ratio and head into a much faster, more momentum move uh, for Camco versus the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, there it is, basically zoomed in, and you can see that we are accelerating into the fly zone, according to Scott. Uh, so we got Grady here. He says, seriously impressed uh, by how gold in all currencies is holding up lately while real yields. So I already went over this one yesterday. It is holding up very well. Uh, we are sitting on top of the pattern. We've got a breakout, a back test, and another back test. Um, and it looks fantastic for a big move to the upside. Oh, it looks like I haven't gone over that. So silver producers, second quarter, silver production. Uh, Fresnillo, 14.9 million. Uh, in production ounces for quarter two of silver. And this is their break-even costs. Look at some of the break-even costs. $21.52, $21, $22, $23.69. This is the break-even. Those are the high-cost producers. So when you look at this, you're probably seeing the high-cost producers come down quite a bit. Those are going to be the rocket ships that go up to the upside. Those high-cost producers, the AISCUSD, those are the ones, but they're going to be a lot more volatile. So get ready. They're going to be volatile, but they're going to be big movers to the upside when the silver price moves on higher. Uh, this is the rise in yields uh, is global, ex-China. So this is Japan 10-year bond yields. Just rip into the upside. Look at that move, guys. Uh, much like the uh, United States bond yields. Look at the double bottom here. You can draw a line across. So you got a double bottom, you come up, you hit your head on resistance, and then you break it and you're starting to run. That's technical analysis right there. Uh, downward, sideways, basing pattern, and then the big move to the upside. This is exactly what the majority of commodity stocks are going to look like. The same exact pattern as what we're seeing today. And we are located on this right-hand side over here for the majority of the stocks. We have not broken and, and moved to the upside yet. Uh, and that's what I've got for today, guys. So. Um, if you guys enjoyed the clip, give me a thumb up, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the website, uh, and everything looks A-OK. -okay. So that's all I've got for today. Uh, we do have a platinum question and answer session coming up at 5 p.m. Sunday. And uh, we'll see you guys there if you're part of the finding-value.com community. All right, guys. Catch you later. This is Finding Value.